Hi, everyone. I want to warmly welcome you to today's semi-final of WHO 2020. Congrats to both teams on making it so far out of 108 teams. Um, on side proposition, we have Team USA Blue. On side opposition, we have Team Canada Red. My name is Sabina Grigore. I am from Romania, currently living in Germany. Together with me, there is a very fine panel who I would like to introduce uh, themselves. Um, let me see, starting maybe with Hanna. Hi, my name is Hanna Bushkova. I judge for the Czech Debate Association. Then Mislav. Hi, everyone. I'm Mislav from Croatia. Nika? Hi, uh, I'm Nika. I'm also from Croatia. Daha? I am Daha. I speak for the LSE. And Urska? Hi, I'm Urska and I'm from Slovenia. Have I missed anyone? I do not think so. If I have, please do introduce yourself. <laughs> if not, then Today's motion is this house regrets the commercialization of the social and political causes. Three notes before we start. POIs, please state your preference before the speech. If there are not, uh, if these preferences are not directly stated, I would ask you to put the POIs vocally so that everyone can hear them. Second note is timing. Please time yourselves. Um, I will also time and if you uh, go over the 830, I will just raise my hands so you know that I'm not writing anymore and there is no point in really going on with that debate. So um, yeah, you can wrap up that quickly. And third of all, I wish you good luck. I wish you a good debate. And without further ado, I would like the first speaker of proposition to start this debate here, here. Just making sure I'm audible. Okay, awesome. And I prefer verbal POIs. When the word feminist gets plastered onto stereotypical products marketed at women claiming to fight the stigma while displaying a complete array of everything pink, and when clothing stores can sell t-shirts that say go green or for the earth while dumping millions of dollars worth of clothes into landfills yearly, what corporations have done is trivialized and exploited injustice for their own financial gain. We're proud to propose the motion, this house regrets the corporate commercialization of social and political causes. In today's speech, a couple of things. First, a few notes on framework before introducing our first and second substantive argument. My partner will be presenting our third in her next speech. Let's first talk about some notes on framework though. It's necessary to note that commercialization isn't inherently for profit. Corporate commercialization means selling pro products for financial gain you're profiting off of it. We support commercialization by social movements and nonprofits themselves because they are not making profits that aren't going to the cause. The distinction is that corporate commercialization is financial gain for the company and not for the movement that it seeks to commercialize. So what does opposition world looks like? It looks like Pepsi making an ad about the Black Lives Matter movement where Kendall Jenner handed a can of soda to police officers effectively ending police brutality or Forever 21 slapping feminist slogans on shirts, tote bags, any product they can get their hands on. Also note that in the status quo, corporations commercialize when the social movement is already trendy and popular in order to get a wider consumer base, meaning they don't add on that much exposure. Even further, the vast majority of corporate commercialization doesn't provide funding to these causes they're commercializing. But even if some revenue does go to these causes, we think that com corporate commercialization is still very bad. We regret this world that opposition has because in because this world in which corporations have commercialized social and political causes because we think it undermines movements through shallow messaging and is unjust. In our world, we support social movements filling in the gaps themselves with social media activity and other movements. What social movements can do on our side of the house is th that they can still create products to sell. This is how they get a ton of their financial support, particularly in a world in which people want to show their support for a cause publicly. Let's now go on to our first substantive talking about harming social movements. Our first idea talks about corporate commercialization and how it's intrinsically shallow. 
Corporate commercialization largely distorts and dilutes movements. It allows for social and political causes to be viewed as products and not social causes themselves. Corporations look at these social and political causes, valuing their monetary capacity rather than the potential that these movements have for reform. First, they modify this cause to be the most mar marketable it can be. Companies don't start social trends because that's super risky. They just jump onto trends because they see potential profit. So movements that support really important but not popular positions are likely to be ignored by companies and in, in favor of things that can be marketed to the broadest group possible. This is the incentive of these corporations, right? They don't care about whether or not the message of these causes are truly expressed to all consumers. Rather, they want their consumers to open their wallet and buy a new tote bag with feminist or any other slogan on it. Compare this to the incentive that these movements hold. They want people to understand the true message of their cause rather than looking for profit, they're looking for dedicated supporters. The second harm of this is that diluted products being worn and used begins to distort the public's image of that movement itself. It's preferable if all products that symbolize a cause are representative than if a lot of unrepresentative products exist. Don't let opposition say that this argument is in tension with our framing. When you buy things from the social movement itself, money directly goes to that cause, you're forced to be exposed to the cause itself, and the organization has an active incentive to ensure that those consumers buying that product also understand their message. So commercialization from these causes themselves doesn't distort the movement in the same way. Second mechanism here is short-term ideas. Understand that social movements need long-term sustainability in order to gain any form of traction. This is why BLM, even though it was created seven years ago, wasn't such a large popular movement until this year. There's, a little, there's little social change that can be created by a month-long campaign or one ad from a corporation. Tangible, sustainable, and substantive reform is created through dedicated effort that you don't get out of corporate commercialization. This looks like rainbows being put on literally every single product during Pride Month, and then these products suddenly being phased out once Pride is over. You need people interested in LGBTQ plus rights year out, not just one month of one year. What these corporations do is effectively label these causes as a fleeting fad rather than something that can create monumental change. When you see something in your environment for only one month, you don't truly normalize these movements. Rather, you allow for society to view these movements as simple trends that are only viable during one period of time. It creates far more harm than any marginal good. And it also doesn't force anyone who truly opposes the movement to engage with it because it can just ignore what's going on and go back to life as normal once the ad campaign is over. Third mechanism here is taking resources away from social movements. Given that people will want to support the movement in either world, they still find a place to buy the merchandise. Uniquely, they turn to the movements themselves in our world and buy directly from that cause. This is uniquely good because our world guarantees that every single profit goes directly to the movement and cause it supports, giving them the financial capability to expand their reach and create more positive change. This looks like March for Our Lives merch, which became super popular with young people and allowed the organization to create a get out the vote tour around swing states. In opposition, people don't go to these organizations because corporations advertise their products and put them in all of their physical stores so people buy what's closest, never going directly to the source and just doing things that are only easy for them. Let's go on to our second substantive then, talking about how it's immoral to profit off of injustice. The incentives of corporations are not at all benevolent. Many are willing to flip-flop stances on important issues to keep up social trends. Three mechanisms here. First, companies exploit people suffering for profit. Why do social movements exist in the first place? They exist to not only get attention, but to also get resources towards the cause and to solve the injustices in the first place. So in terms of that injustice, we think it's immoral to advertise to consumers that the injustice is happening, but then profit off of that suffering with the money not going to the causes themselves. I'll take your point. Philanthropic organizations also indirectly exploit the suffering and exploitation of the oppressed. Like, like obviously you can frame like philanthropy and volunteering in many different ways. We think that it's quite different, this exploitation that you're phrasing, because in a world where corporations are literally directly contributing to the problem and then turn around and just make products saying, oh, we need to fight that injustice, it's completely different from you know social causes saying this is a big problem and just advertising that problem as something that needs to be solved. Let's go back to our substantive two. 
in which we're telling you about how it's immoral to profit off of that injustice and how commercial corporate commercialization does so. For example, let's say you start a GoFundMe for somebody with cancer and a heavy amount of medical bills. It's immoral to advertise and get money from like buying merchandise that supports the people and then not giving that money, that person the money in the first place. Even an opposition's best case scenario in which you don't donate 50% of the proceeds to the movement, that's still principally immoral because you're raising money off of somebody's suffering and then making profit off of it with without actually addressing the issue at hand. We think that even further, companies are often active participants in many of the harms the movements they commercialize fight against. When you watch Forever 21 making clothes with feminist slogans on it, you ignore the fact that across the world, girls are literally being overworked in factories with low wages, horrible conditions, and a workplace that is far from empowering women. It is principally immoral to be perpetuators of injustice and then profit off, the fighting, profit off of fighting that injustice itself. What's the comparative we provide? We solve that issue because the actor that can reap benefits from products is the cause itself. All of those profits go to it. Even further, social movements should have autonomy over their movement. They should be able to control that image and the image of a cause rather than a corporation being able to dilute and distort it. We think that side proposition is the only one that truly allows for social and political causes to gain any form of traction we're proud to propose. Thank you very much for that fine speech. If my panel is ready, I would ask the first speaker of the opposition to start their, their line of argumentation. Here, here. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Panel, please don't let proposition get away with their ridiculous counter model in this debate. I want to make it very clear off the top of my speech what the trade off in this round really is. Proposition has to sacrifice a massive amount of funding and awareness. And this is because they can't just say, we're going to raise funds by some other means, for example, through social media or by their nonprofit organization creating shirts. Because in order to appeal to the average person, you need bite-sized information if you want them to buy those shirts in the first place, which means that you must necessarily sacrifice the complexity of the issue and therefore their counter model and this point about the dilution of their message can't coexist. If you buy a shirt from a social movement, like March for Our Lives, you don't magically know about the history of the social movement or niche other social movements that are happening on the in the world. So you don't you get that dilution either way. But furthermore, this is always going to be beholden to whichever issues are most profitable if you want to get some sort of symmetry in the types of money that you get. This means that in order for proposition to get its full principled benefits, they must re re uh, relegate those social issues to the corners of public discourse to preserve the purity of those issues. So they probably get no change at all in terms of the critical mass of people that are buying into those issues. On our side, we would concede, yes, you do somewhat dilute issues, but you get billions of more dollars for social movements, you Wait. get millions of more supporters, and you provide a foundation for political change. This is a trade-off that we're willing to make. Uh, I'm going to do a couple of things in this speech. First, I'm going to rebut the proposition case, then forward my own two arguments. First, why you get more money for social movements. Secondly, why you get more awareness for issues. But on rebuttal, first of all, so their counter model is that corporate commercialization is not for money. But there's always an incentive to give money to social issues. And this is just empirically true. For example, Bell, uh, Heineken, like Nike, Patagonia, H&M, they've all ran their own campaigns in which donations go to social issues. And the reason behind that is for the same example that they gave about the Pepsi and the Kylie Jenner commercial. Like, if you don't like give any good attention to those social issues, there's going to be massive backlash. That social movement isn't going to agree with you, and they're going to speak out against you. In order to save your own company's image, you always want to give money and support to that social issue. Then they say the social movement itself is going to be the one creating the products. This makes absolutely no sense. Social movements are not centralized organizations. There isn't the feminist movement clothing factory. They're probably just small creators who need to provide money for their own families as well that are going to be creating those shirts on their side of the house, which probably means that you can't have a world where all of the profits go to social issues either way. Then they say that messages are going to be diluted. Issues without a lot of attention won't get attention anyways. I'm not sure where the link is on their side. Then they say that these are going to be fad trends that just like dissipate in a few months. But the thing with merchandising is that it's more long lasting than something like a social media hashtag or one event. So I can wear a shirt over time while my tweet is going to disappear down my wall in a few months. So on both sides, there are fads. On our side, it's probably less of a fad because I could use my feminist water bottle for the next five years. Then they say that these companies profit off of people's suffering. 
look, if you're going to sell shirts from March for Our Lives, which is what their counter model is, these are going to be Gildan shirts made in Bangladeshi sweatshops anyways. So if they want to be sustainable, there's going to be less money going to the movement. But if they want to maximize the amount of money that's going to the movement, they have to concede exploitation. Moving on into my points then, first and why you get more money for social movements. So why is this true? There are two reasons. First, that you get more money when people purchase products as opposed to individual donations. So look, you are also getting something in return when you purchase a product that means there's a lower barrier of entry towards uh, like giving money to that organization versus something that is just a donation there's an opportunity cost so if I give if I give twenty dollars to BLM that takes twenty dollars off of my next purchase but if I just buy a jacket and then the company donates for me then I'm getting two things as opposed to one so in other forms of advocacy, you only have people that are already very engaged. So if they want to say that the social movement is going to be creating shirts as opposed to Nike that is creating shirts, then only people that already buy into that social movement are going to be the ones that's buying that merchandise. As opposed to a product that's created by Nike where 20% of the proceeds go to BLM, I still want that Nike jacket. So people that might not have been in that social movement are likely to buy those goods. So on our side, people donate when at most they would have otherwise shared a hashtag. Now people can donate donate by buying the things that they need and by going uh, ab about their daily lives. This is a big change. Patagonia in 2016 donated over $300 million to climate change organizations by giving the money that they got from their Black Friday sales. That is a huge amount of money for any social movement. The second reason you get more money is that corporations can now make social media advocacy better. So people are going to look for the easy thing to do either way. So it's not like on proposition, everybody just magically attends protests. Slacktivism is probably going to be something that people turn to because it's very easy and it's very simple. But the people that are drawn to posting black squares on their Instagram feeds are probably also the people who are most affected by corporate advocacy. So the question is, how do we maximize the contributions made by those people? When social media movements are the providers of money behind like social social media advocacy, most people don't like but most people don't donate otherwise because they might not have a credit card or they don't want to or they don't have money. But now when you say share this post and this corporation is going to, going to donate a dollar to saving the trees or Bell Let's Talk, which is a Canadian movement where every time you repost something on your story, a dollar gets donated to mental health, you maximize the contributions of people who otherwise would have done nothing. And the impacts of this money are massive. It's not a vague impact because movements need money to reach a critical mass of people to achieve their goals. This looks like the BLM bailout funds for protests that are arrested, organizing protests and rallies to force concessions by the government, events like Pride, which is the only place where some gay people feel safe holding hands, or you're able to pay people like minority speakers to share the stories and to get the nuance in your social movement that proposition wants. Money is a means to awareness and change is not just like uh, awareness. Uh, yeah, I'll take a POI before my second point. Okay, if there are no POI, second point that a more awareness for social issues. The characterization here is that it's absolutely untrue that most social issues can be normalized through niche means like proposition size, like just the social movement itself, or through non-corporate means like social media. This is because the deep analytical stuff that Prop wants is a very niche audience, but even more widespread things like hashtags, not everybody uses like Twitter or Instagram. Most people above the age of 30 or most Facebook users, which are most of the world, will primarily engage in real life spheres and not on social media. So how does commercialization exclusively help? Regardless of when, whether or not the issue is detailed, you still get a lot of normalization. And this happens in a few ways. First, in the sheer amount of social justice Wait. symbols public discourse. So when lots of people have a Me Too pin or a pride flag shirt, this goes into the world beyond your phone and beyond your Instagram feed. So it becomes ingrained in our cultural paradigm. This is because people always want to feel like they're a part of a group, which is why we wear stylish clothes, for instance. We think we should be doing this one thing. So when pride flag symbols are everywhere, when the month of June is full of rainbows, the middle-aged couple who might have otherwise seen their gay son as an anomaly will now feel like he's normal. Or a woman who now feels more comfortable coming forward about work place harassment because her co-worker has a Me Too bo water bottle, as opposed to like random faceless people on the internet who might have been spreading hashtags. The second way this helps normalization is on credibility. So when a brand that you love and that you trust comes out with a message, you're more likely to buy into it than a random guy in a social movement or online. For instance, when Budweiser came out with German immigration ads, or when Nike ran a campaign around Colin Kaepernick, this assigns credibility to those issues and it makes people more likely to buy in, as opposed to it's just a radical 
radical cry coming from the social justice warrior left. It's a brand that you trust and now it's something that you can buy into. The third way this happens is that you diversify messages. So social movements can now break into the mainstream. Feminist symbols can appear on, for example, androgynous clothing brands. And so since consumerism is accept accessible to everybody, you broaden those messages. This is important because it makes people more likely to buy it. It makes people feel okay to speak out and it makes people feel more accepting of others. Commercialization is necessary for societal change. Very proud to oppose. If my panel is ready, I would invite the second speaker of the proposition to go on with the debate. Here, here. Can everybody hear me? Okay. My, uh, can everybody hear me? My Wi-Fi is actually not great. So if somebody could type something in the chat, just let me know because everyone's frozen. Okay. She just got kicked. Um, I'm communicating with her right now. Hello. Sorry, I just got kicked earlier. Can everybody hear me? Yes, no worries. I would suggest that everyone else besides you switches off the camera so just we can avoid yeah connection issues. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, so we're good. Just want to make sure. I think the largest underlying assumption of side opposition's case is that money is ultimately the most important thing in forwarding a social movement. And while we do agree that funding is really crucial to a social movement, if you're missing an aspect in which people genuinely care and are able to commit acts beyond giving money to Nike, beyond actually just donating they want a jacket, that's when we get real change. Because true legislative change comes from the popular support of these type of movements, come from passionate individuals who are willing to sign petitions and show up at protests. Those are the individuals that side opposition entirely loses insofar as their biggest mechanism is just wanting a jacket and inadvertently donating to a cause. Given that, I wanna do a couple things in my speech. Firstly, give a couple of clarifications of our counterfactual and how we attempt solvency on our side for the social movements. Secondly, go on to the two clashes of today's debate on A, buy-in, and secondly, on the principle. And third, present our third substantive argument on side proposition on hiding workplace abuse by these type of big corporations in question. So firstly, let's talk about these organizations. So they say that on ours of the house, the counterfactual does not work because there are not specific organizations that are faces of movements, et cetera. We'd argue this is false. If it's a feminist movement, then organizations like Planned Parenthood or like smaller organizations in like support of those things are the organizations we're talking about. Organizations like Time's Up who spearheaded the Me Too movement are organized structures under the feminist movement that are we are talking about in today's debate and in addition for most racial movements as well as the examples that opposition chose to bring up there are faces as well as organized 
structures under the specific causes that we are willing to donate to and that we are willing to support them in in doing their own commercialization. And note crucially that on our side house, we're not necessarily against the idea of commercialization so long as it's done by the social movement itself, as we believe that that undercuts largely the harms of the most offensive arguments that we have brought to you. And also it forces individuals to ultimately learn more. And we think that the harms of mainstream commercialization by companies and clothing brands are far worse than anything that these movements can do, which is why we regret it. And we'd much prefer that there be less investment on our set house, if that's the worst case, than the amount of investment that that we have in the status quo that we've seen that has led to a diluting of these type of movements. So firstly, let's talk about the idea of exposure. A couple of broad responses here. Firstly, note that the idea they're going to spearhead movements and normalize things is simply false. We already told you you that corporations only jump onto the movement when it already is mainstream. That means they're not really doing much in the most crucial situations and the most crucial time frames where these movements need support. If we look to the LGBTQ plus movement, nobody was making shirts with rainbow hearts on them during where people needed support, but rather they are doing it now because it's popular and now an aesthetic as well as trendy. And that's why American Eagle is choosing to capitalize off of the, this narrative. So the whole idea that we're going to be starting some new revolution and normalizing these thoughts are likely not going to happen as these corporations only decide to invest and create these campaigns when they know there's likely going to be popular buy-in. So we just think that most of their impacts are mitigatory insofar as movements have already gained traction when corporations do this. But secondly, Let's look at the individuals who are going to buy these things and what they're really doing in this situation. So the analysis we hear from Gabby's speech is that because you want a jacket, you feel as though there's a return and you feel as though that you're getting something in addition to this donation, which incentivizes you to do so. Note that this in no way engages with the mechanisms we talk about for effective social change, which is the fact that individuals actually go and learn about these issues. These individuals feel motivated enough to protest and feel an attachment on their side of the house. All they make people do is inadvertently buy into this and give money to Nike, of which 20% will perhaps be devoted to these causes. And we think that the most important thing for a social movement is not necessarily capital, but social resources and human resources in which individuals choose to take this initiative. At best, they might get more money, but I'll later outweigh this by telling you why it's worse that people are now not actually feeling like they are involved or not feeling as though they should be involved. But next, let's engage with this narrative that if a grandma sees like pride flags everywhere, perhaps they will like accept their gay son more and see it as more normalized. Firstly, we already told you that the environment likely already normalizes this on social media and in broader society if companies choose to take this choice. But secondly, we think that's bad that people are thinking that these problems are solved just because Walmart decides to put out a pride flag. Because I think in the majority of cases, if we look at problems like LGBTQ plus violence, violence against transgender individuals is still very, very rampant and unchecked. And racial violence is simply very, very prominent as well in society. And these issues are actually downplayed by these companies when they make it seem like everybody's in support and there is no radical opposition because there are just pride flags everywhere. And they actually underplay the massive impacts and the things that happen to these individuals of these communities when that happens. So I think people are much likely to be unaware of the things that are truly happening on their set house insofar as they're under the impression that everything is okay and that I don't really need to do much, see all of these companies showing up for these people already. But next they might say that the harms are symmetrical on our set house if social movements just do the commercialization. Why is this not true, right? Firstly, note that on our set house, social movements are likely going to get most of the money now because we think historically, since this is a regrets motion, if we look to most of the biggest campaigns, sure, 50% of the proceeds might go towards these companies, but that's still a massive amount that's not going to the social movement. On our side of the house, we think that there's still an incentive to donate, as Gabby also flags at the top of her speech. Some companies will probably do this for publicity. They want to look good. If on our side of the house, there's a norm in which you give 100% of the proceeds to the movement, that's more money on our side if we accept that money is a good mechanism. But secondly, note that on our side, there's a distinction because inherently there's less of acceptance or a perceived acceptance from main Stream media. When you walk down the street, you don't see every single company or every single store supporting it. So it feels still in a minority and still in a niche, which is what we need to really cultivate change to back off as well as combat this type of complacency that exists in their world if the messaging is overwhelming that everybody's in support because that's simply not true. On their set house, they don't get individuals who truly want to participate to do so. They feel as though their simple action in buying a jacket is enough. That is the harm. They don't explain why money is good beyond simple 
simply asserting it. Next, I want to quickly touch on our principle, which goes in completely unengaged, other than a one-liner response that says, oh, well, they're going to exploit Gildan on both sides of the house. Yes, this is true. But what they miss in the nuance of the argument is that on our side of the house, sure, Gildan will be exploited on both sides, but the movement itself and the human suffering of the movement, in addition to Gildan, will not be, right? On our side of the house, both of the shirts will be made by the same exploitative companies, but the cause of Black Lives Matter is not, that's a marginal benefit on our side of the house. They never explain the argument of exploitation or respond. But lastly, I want to talk about a third substantive argument on hiding workplace abuses and such. On their side of the house, when we have the commercialization of these social causes, these companies are able to be in the disguise that they are in support of these causes while they have people who are suffering under their company as well as under their actions. This looks like Forever 21 making clothes in support of feminism while young girls are stripped of their education and working in their horrible factories, or Walmart having major workplace issues while putting out pride flags. In this way, this is moral licensing, justifying and correcting this with performative action. People are less likely going to be questioning what they're doing, and we think there's going to be less scrutiny if the media as well as individuals think that these companies are 100% for these marginalized groups as well as for these minorities, so they'll turn a blind eye to all the things that are actually happening because it seems as though they're giving 50% of the proceeds of a specific collection to these social groups. At the end of the day, we don't think they prove solvency because money doesn't lead to change. And we think on our side of the house, even if there's less money, we get individuals who are far more invested and far more likely to learn about the issue and care. That's what we get on our side of the house. We're proud to stand on that proposition. So I don't know if you've heard me before, but if my panel is ready, I would like to invite the second speaker of the opposition to continue their line of argumentation. Here, here. Let us be clear about two things at the top of this speech. Number one, there's a massive characterization tension in the proposition case. Their main claim out of first proposition is that commercialized messaging is vague and unnuanced because companies have a profit incentive to cater towards consumers who are also vague and unnuanced. But in the same breath, they say that their alternative relies on the nuanced form of messaging that consumers want. We don't know what characterization that they want to buy into, whether or not their alternative works in the instance that consumers are nuanced, or whether or not in the instance of our case, consumers are not nuanced. So obviously there is a cost to their alternative. They have to buy all of the perceptual harms of decreasing revenue, of decreasing a critical mass of support that we get that is important for things like voting and legislative reform. Second thing I wanna mention, if their metric for corporate commercialization is that it is unjust for companies to gain revenue and utility gains, we cut out a bunch of their alternatives too, because we're quite unclear on Team Canada what regular commercialization is. Bell might set up Bell Let's Talk programs that support mental health initiatives, but although they're not selling a product and directly gaining utility, they're also gaining positive reputation where companies and individuals are more likely to buy into Bell communication networks because they like their company, because there's a need for social justice. So crucially, Proposition in this house needed to clarify the middle ground, albeit a, bit a, a little late in the third proposition speech. They need to engage with a vast majority of cases where companies do actually commercialize in a mutually beneficial way, where although Nike may generate avenue off of AdSense, BLM also gets massive amount of money in their bailout fund. Although Patagonia does actually get a bunch of AdSense and public reputation gains, they also benefit the climate change movement as well. Commercialization isn't just one-sided. In the vast majority of cases, it is mutually beneficial, and that's the fatal flaw in Team USA's case. I'll do three things in this speech. In terms of clash, ask two questions. Number one, how does commercialization actually manifest in which we will deal with propositions characterization, and then we'll quickly engage with the principle. And then a third and final argument on corporations and why the comparative in the absence of commercialization is far worse. First, on how does commercialization manifest? They say that it manifests through shallow and counterproductive messaging, to which we have three responses. Number one, there are probably natural incentives to keep the messaging fairly reasonable and not bad. Obviously, we can concede that some parts of this messaging will be shallow, but the shallowness of messaging will exist on both sides of the house. What we cannot concede to is that this messaging will be bad. And the reason why is that there are natural incentives for this messaging to be good. They have to compete with other companies to capture social justice capital. There's a reasonable amount of backlash if this messaging is good. 
Let's use Team USA's example against themselves. They posit the example of Kendall Jenner and the Pepsi ad, but that Pepsi ad generated a massive amount of backlash where Nike did actually lose profit because people didn't like that ad, because people recognized that it was an oversimplification of BLM and police brutality. So obviously the same profit incentive that we support on our side of the house is a profit incentive to make this messaging good. Second of all, we're just not sure what their alternative is. If it is a case that there's an incentive for companies to have shallow messaging, that probably reflects consumers' incentive to have shallow messaging as well. This just indicates that 100% of the fault cannot be blamed on companies. It's not just they want shallow messaging, they want to cater towards a large amount of people who also want shallow messaging. So crucially, if the messaging is shallow and the nature of the messaging is unnuanced, that is going to be symmetric on either side of the house. So the question in this debate then becomes, how do we generate the most funding? How do we make sure that that shallow and unnuanced funding and messaging goes to a wider critical mass of people instead of just some people on an 100 follower critical uh, Twitter uh, page? The third thing we should know is that there's probably no capacity for social causes to generate their message. Their mechanism is that social justice movements will create shirts, but come on, like Planned Parenting does not create clothing, BLM does not create water bottle, and the reason why is that they don't have the supply chains and revenue to mass produce all of these things. Like their mechanism of creating shirts is just ridiculous. And crucially, here's where our argument about funding does actually play into this debate. We noted that companies do have the money to do things like mass produced t-shirts, for instance. They do have deep pockets. There are two destructive implications of this. Implication number one is that we do need funding and a large amount of capital in a lot of cases. BLM needs a bunch of money to bail out the critical mass of people that are now in jail because of the corrupt state. But number two, we do need a lot of people and a lot of appeal. Even if this message is shallowing, it engages a lot of people. And the reason why this magnitude of people is important is because you need a lot of people to vote for legislation, for instance. You need that 51% majority in the House of Commons and the Parliament if we're talking about US politics. Wait. Second, on the principle. Let's just destroy their principle. They say that it's unjust to profit off of injustices and the suffering and the oppression of people. We have two responses. Number one. Obviously, this principle is hinged and it's a non-argument. If we're able to prove that we're able to benefit these causes and social justice movements by giving them funding and a critical mass of appeal, then we can prove that even though companies are profiting, they're profiting off of the alleviation of suffering. But number two, if we buy their analysis, the logical extension of it is ridiculous. Warren Buffett might set up philanthropic organizations, for instance, that help starving African children, but even though he benefits off of PR reasons and that Berkshire Hathaway now becomes more Point. popular, that doesn't mean that that mutually beneficial relationship is unjust. Obviously, we're able to benefit these social causes to a greater extent, even if it's the case that you generate some profit on the turnout. I'll take that POI before I go on to the third argument. The PR benefits that Warren Buffett gets does not come in direct competition with the resources sources of the social movement. The distinction on your side of the house is that companies take money away from the social movement whilst harming no, 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 it no, no, with no. like- So, so they don't take away money from the social movement. In fact, they add to it. If Nike supports the BLM bailout fund by promising a certain percentage of their revenues on a certain ad, Colin Kaepernick, for instance, that's a form of beneficial revenue. If like Adidas supports the parlay shoe, which promises to, to, to donate like 30% of revenue to plastic alleviation in the oceans, that's obviously a num like a lot of money that goes into our side of the house. Third argument then, and by the way, this is also going to engage with that POI, on why corporations and the comparative is far worse. This argument is going to prove is that although corporations may act in a mediocre way right now, they're far worse in proposition side of the house in the pursuit of profit. And what we should observe is that a profit incentive will exist on either side of the house. Nothing really changes. Companies still have profit margins to protect. They're still beholden to shareholders. They still have to cover costs in a meaningful capacity. So the question in this debate then becomes, if a profit incentive is symmetric due to the structural nature of companies, how best do these companies channel that profit into incentives? On our side of the house, we channel it for good because although it's not that efficient to generate things like awareness through companies, it's one way to generate awareness. And at the very least, we're not creating negative outcomes. But on their side of the house, they can actually actively lobby against these socio-political causes. If Patagonia does not longer create a profit advantage to support things like climate change, it's no longer worth it, for instance, to indirectly support climate regulations if they do fund the Green Party because they don't get profit on their side of the house. So the comparative then means that these companies in the pursuit of profit are likely going to lobby against the very social causes that proposition wants to protect. It's lobbying for loosening environmental regulations, for instance, or creating bad environmental policy, such as setting up factories and sweatshops. So notably, the commercialization of these companies 
makes it worth it for companies to actually advocate for reform. Although it is the case that indirectly supporting the Green Party, for instance, does cut into their costs, that cost is bulwarked against the fact that they have massive amounts of profit. Crucially, commercialization acts as a bulwark against the negative incentives that companies have. If you regret this profit incentive, then all that means is that that profit incentive channels to less good incentives, lobbying against these social causes, lobbying against regulations that actually benefit them. So in the end, if they wanted to care about the moral implications of suffering, they needed to care about alleviating that suffering as well. Obviously, their principle is hinged, and they really need to engage with the vast majority of cases. We're very proud to oppose. Thank you very much for your speech. If my panel is ready, I would want to welcome the third speaker of proposition. Here, here. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? And I would prefer audible POIs, if that's good. I think the reason why opposition loss is because they miss incentives of corporations. Because before corporations decide to commercialize, recognize that the social movements are commercializing are already popular because they want to have a wide consumer base. So presumably, before corporations start commercializing the Black Lives Matter movement, the LGBTQ movement, most people in society mo know about these issues and know that's something that's being addressed. But granted then that you have already a critical mass of people who have knowledge of these issues, the next step then for social movements to actually create change is to convince these people what the problems are why it needs to be addressed and what the solutions are. So if you really believe that Walmart saying we stand with pride or Kendall Jenner handing a Pepsi can solves the issues of police brutality, you vote for opposition. But if you believe that structural problems require structural solutions, you vote for proposition. Three questions I'm going to ask. First, do you help social movements? Second, is corporate commercialization morally just? Third, what happens to the perceptions of companies? The first question, do you help social movements or not? They tell you that you get more exposure when you have commercialization, and thus not only do you get more attention to push for political issues, you also get more resources to the movement. Two bits of characterization I want to note before refuting it. First, recognize that a lot of their exposure impacts are over-exaggerated, because recognize that companies only commercialize and piggyback when the social or political movement is popular in society because they want to sell to a lot of people. Meaning that when police brutality protests erupted in America, 99% of society knew what Black Lives Matter was, so putting a sign doesn't really increase exposure. They over-exaggerated their impacts. Second, another bit of characterization is that social movements have a long way to go. That is, discrimination requires political change and deep specialized knowledge of what you do to actually address these issues, and so that's what you get on our side. Three mechanisms, then, for why corporate commercialization reduces this. First, you get a simplistic view of these issues. So when Kendall Jenner came in and handed the Pepsi to the officers, can you seriously expect people to learn about serious uh, to learn about how police brutality is in society with these kinds of ads. And when it's pride bags sold by Walmart, you don't get the issues that actually need to be solved. We aren't saying the messages are bad because second opposition tried to say, oh, they have incentive to make it good. What makes it intrinsic in corporate messaging is that it has to be one or two words because you're trying to sell your products and people aren't going to accept statistics when they buy into the head of, uh, in the, in the treadmill of consumer, consumerism. While it may not be research paper level on our side, they never proved why our messaging will just be as shallow as theirs. Because online activism, as Abby told you, isn't just slacktivism in black squares. It's conversations, discussions, statistics, and emotional stories that show the extent of the problem that the social movement is solving. To simply, uh, to simply categorize Me Too as a hashtag was very destructive for Opposition One. Because the fact is, when you devote more political capital to allowing, to allowing social movements to have the sort of messaging, you get more problem and solution-oriented messaging on our side house that actually shows people how to solve the issues. Second, you get complacency because recognize we're going to turn this normalization warrant against them. Remember what Abby told you in the two, when you buy a shirt and you, uh, when you buy a shirt from a company, you think you're done supporting its social movements because you bought in, you got benefits and you gave to them. What we tell you is that you have to get people deeply invested into the social movement and you have to get them to vote for them in the future and you have to get them to know the problems. Third, it's inherently short termist. So Pete, when Walmart says we only should support pride and they only change your logo for a month or so. This was a warrant that actually gave you a no one. It's right. short termist for these social movements and inherently makes them more trending, which means you don't get more long term action in the future. But you seem to disagree. If people are to buy into nuanced forms of messaging, that still exists on our side of the house. This is about corporations capturing people who are not yet aware. 
the people that you protect oh, are probably yeah. already aware to a massive extent. No, no, no. Okay. So there's different levels of exposure, right? What we're telling you right now is that most people already know about these issues very superficially. Like most people know about the Black Lives Matter movement before corporations started to commercialize. What we tell you then on our side is the best ways to not crowd out the messaging given by social movements and not to get complacency from people when they just buy a shirt and buy into like a one word slogan and then don't do anything else. What you need is actual change and actual attention. You can't get critical mass, even if people say police brutality is a bad issue. You need to know the solutions to how you solve them and you can't crowd out the police capital of the social movements in their own social and uh, their own nuancing. Why do we tell you that knowledge investment is the most important clash in this state, even if they ruin the resources clash? First, recognize that knowledge and investment into social movements is a prerequisite, prerequisite to resources. So even to get, get short-term donating on behalf of corporations, recognize that the most donations come from individual people simply because there are more people than corporations. So that means if we get more long-term investment on our side, that means more people are willing to donate resources in the long term, more willing to donate to the Black Lives Matter movement and the bailout fund. Second, and most importantly, this is what Abby told you, you need legislative and political will. So if you don't know the problem and don't know the solutions to the problem of police brutality or the gender wage gap, you don't know where you're going to vote for on the ballot. There's not enough social political capital in society in order to demand for certain solutions by politicians in order to actually get governmental change on the structural level in order to deal with it. And we told you crucially the characterization that social movements aren't done with their change. They need political will, and most crucially, they need people who know about these issues. But I also want to tell you why we actually get more money to social movements, because it was very, because uh, there's three reasons why there's wrong. First, it was just weird to say that all corporations are donating the proceeds. No, the vast majority of companies sell things such as uh, such such as uh, Forever 21 selling shirts with feminist slogans or Walmart with pride flags. These are the vast majority of products in which you don't say, oh, this percentage of the profits go to them. They only give you a few isolated examples and say, oh, we just win because this is the vast majority. Recognize they have a profit incentive, so they're likely to not donate. Second, and their best example, 20% of the revenue goes to social movements. We agree with their characterization that they're motivated, motivated people on either side. So the people who are already deeply passionate about issues will be the one buying pride flags on their side. So presumably for the already passionate people, it would be better if they just donate their money or buy merchandise of social movements themselves. And that way is 100% of the consumer's money is actually going to social movements, even if there's a smaller percentage of overall money going on because corporations take 80% of it in their best case scenario. Second class I want to talk about on the principle Ashley gave you two clear mechanisms. First, it was immoral to profit off suffering that social movements seek to address. And this wasn't about philanthropy, because philanthropy gives 100% of their proceeds to the issues and the injustices. The, the PR reputation that Op2 tried to talk about is merely a side benefit, right? 100% proceeds are going towards injustices. When we gave you the analogy of someone with a GoFundMe, if someone's like trying to sell merchandise that raises attention about someone with cancer and then takes away 50% of the proceeds, we think that's very morally unjust. The reason why is because presumably social movements are about injustices that you need to address. But if corporations take away those resources by saying this is an issue that we need to address, yet take the money away, we think it's immoral to profit off social issues that need resources in order to address it. You can't say there's a problem in society and we need money, we need bailout funds to address it, but then take the money away from it and go into your own wallet. And note that this is a unique ballot to the path to the ballot for us, because opposition never even tried to address it. They gave one flippant response in opposition one and two. Even if they win and they get more benefits to social movements, we still win this debate because presumably social movements revolve around the notion of justice for minorities and for the issues are deeply oppressed. If you're profiting off this injustice, if you're profiting off the suffering, we think this is morally wrong to do, even to help social movements. Because what you're doing is that you're commercializing people's lives and their human dignity. Thus, we're very proud to propose. Thank you very much for your speech. If my panel is ready, I would like to give the word to opposition to end their line of argumentation. Here, here. Can everyone hear me all right? In the first, second, and third speeches of proposition, Never did we hear a line as to why the rise of corporate commercialization meant that all the other social and political movements couldn't also commercialize the way they wanted to. 
It was never the fact that corporate commercialization stopped them from achieving all their benefits of having the BLM movement sell their scarves or whatever products proposition imagines, or how that actually stops the feminist movement from still promoting the same messages. None of their benefits were mutually exclusive. We can still get all of their very quote unquote nuanced messages that these social and political movements spread. So what this means for this round then is that we basically nullify all of their harms in terms of their argument, in terms of how like the social messages are diluted. And all we have to do is win on a slim margin of if we even have one case of a message that a company is promoting being good, then we could win given that none of their uh, benefits are actually exclusive to their side of the house. With that in mind, I'm going to discuss two questions, actually three questions. Firstly, is this principally justified? Second, do, does corporate commercialization lead to more awareness? And finally, how does this help social and political movements? Just quickly, I wanna get the principle out of the way. Proposition's line of argumentation is that corporations profit off of people suffering. This just isn't logically true because a corporation isn't harming an individual and to profit off of that, they're alleviating their suffering by doing things like donating to the bailout fund, like how Nike did that. And so this argument doesn't even apply in this case because it's not the corporations that are arresting black people on arbitrary basis, for example. Into the second question then, does corporate commercialization lead to more awareness? Proposition's line of argumentation is that this leads to more diluted messaging. And I have a couple of responses to this. Firstly, I think it's just really unclear what quote unquote diluted messaging looks like. And also proposition was just so uncharitable and over-exaggerated here. Listen to what third proposition said. He said, well, a BLM ad is just two words. But look, two words isn't even enough to say Black Lives Matter. It's clearly not the case that corporate commercialization is just that you have two words plastered on your Coke can, for example. It actually does have a degree of nuance. For example, it looks like Nike having ads that can even run to like 45 seconds discussing how Black people face a lot of oppression in society. And then at the end, like saying, well, buy this product if you want to support it. It's not the case that you just simply have the plaster of the social and political movement. They actually do engage with that nuance. But also, what is the comparative on side proposition? Because under their counter model, they say, oh, we also want social and political movements promoting these products and commercializing that so you can give funds to whatever movement you're trying to support. Well, in that case, you also just sell like feminist scarves that have a logo slapped on that. So it's exactly symmetric on their side of the house. Wait. But I, no thanks. But I also want to point out like this thing about, for example, what first proposition said, how you're going to view the social and political movement as specifically tied to the product is just not true. When you buy a Nike shirt that has a BLM logo on it, for example, and somebody tells you about the oppression that black people face, you're probably not just only going to think that, oh, that's just about the t-shirt I bought. You're probably going to be reminded of the suffering that people go through. So even if it doesn't contain all of the nuance, obviously you can't have the history of the oppression that these individuals have faced onto a Nike shirt, but you still are reminded that these issues are things that you should care about and still that matters. What did we say then? So in terms of the fact that the dilution of messaging is likely going to be symmetric on both sides of the house, what matters in the theme of awareness then is on which side do you reach the greatest quantity of people? Second proposition concedes that this is really important. In her introduction, she says funding isn't enough. We need popular support to mobilize people to protest. But it's interesting here when at the five minute mark, she shifted to saying it's actually bad to normalize these social movements. We want a niche group of supporters that is dedicated to this cause. Proposition had to contradict yeah. themselves here because, no thanks, they realized that they would get no change if they only focused on this dedicated group of supporters. It wouldn't be enough to lobby the government to enact certain policies. Yet they had to contradict this because it was their counter model they pushed in first proposition. When first prop said, we're only going to sell products to people within the movement in order to promote the people who actually care about this issue. So because of the way they set up this debate, they, they inherently had less people reach because they solely uh, relied on a, uh, on, a, like, um, on a specific group of people. But in addition to that, we also told you how we get more exposure. The response that we heard from, all, from the two speakers on prop is that while well, companies only jump on the bandwagon for things that are already trendy and popular. But look, this just wasn't a response because even if something is already popular and trend trendy, it can still become even more popular and trendy. It's not just the fact that the entire American population 
knows about the BLM movement, no thanks, or knows about how it actually works. So yes, even if it's already pretty popular, the fact that there are some people who don't get as much exposure. So the BLM movement is just a far away piece of news they might've saw the other day, or it might've just been something you heard about one time. We actually reinforce these messages and we remind people that the still exist. When you have consumers who, when you go to a store, you always see that logo. You're always reminded of this thing that is incredibly important. We went on awareness. This is important because it's necessary to access any other benefits, for example, mobilizing protests. And so we can win this debate solely on that basis. Next question then, on which side do better help social and political movements? So our argument here is that corporation, uh, corporate commercialization has led to greater funds for social and political causes. And we give you a host of examples that Proposition just chose not to engage with. For example, how Nike supported the BLM movement by donating lots of money to the bailout fund. And look, this isn't just like this thing about, oh, we care about money as Proposition tries to dismiss this as not the most important impact. It actually is pretty important because the BLM bailout fund was bailing out protesters who were arrested. This allowed the movement to continue to protest and continue to put pressures on the government. Or for example, how Coca-Cola every year, they donate lots of money to the Pride Parade. And so that supports LGBTQ plus movements to continue to lobby against the government for better legislation and protections. Or it looks like Pentagonia donating lots of money to yeah. organizations, no thanks, so that they can continue to advocate for the fact that we should care about our environment. Money is crucial in this debate because it's necessary for the survival of social and political movements, but also note how it's important for proposition as well, because if you don't have any money, then it's impossible for a movement to sell these products or to get the funding for like the dedicated supporters or whatever their counter model is here. And so money was the foundation for all of that. The response that we heard from proposition for this was simply mitigatory, which is, okay, companies only donate like perhaps a portion of their funds to these organizations, but this is a lot more than what you would get on team proposition, which is just $1 donations you get on Instagram, for example, but when you purchase a product that's a lot more money. But also you get additional funds from people who aren't even supporters. When you just like the way the Nike shoe is designed that has a BLM logo on it, that's also additional funding that we get on our side of the house. But finally, I wanna get into our third argument that third proposition just chose to ignore. In the absence of commercializing social and political issues, corporations would have aggressively blocked the change that social and political movements would push. And the reasoning is simple. It's quite expensive for companies to enact a lot of these changes. So for example, if you push for better labor laws for black people, you're gonna to have to increase your production costs or that cap on carbon emissions is going to force companies to cut down a lot of their production and that also hurts their profits. It's only when you commercialize these issues in which companies can start making concessions because they're also profiting off of that. On team opposition, we get more funds, but even if in proposition's best cases where funds are similar, at least we let corporations clear the path to make concessions and make our world a better place. I'm proud to oppose. Thank you very much for your speech. Now I invite the opposition's reply speaker to end their uh, line of argumentation today. Here, here. Two things to note at the top of this speech. First, that proposition tried to pin a false trade off on us because they actually have no way for people to get invested in the long term. In proposition's best case model, people buy Planned Parenthood sweaters, but there was no link in the entire prop case as to why this magically gives you a nuanced understanding of the issues behind abortion rights or why I will magically just go to protest now that I have this branded feminist scarf. Presumably, this is going to be the same trendy merchandise that we have on our side of the house. So dilution is a wash on both sides of the house. This debate then becomes about things like money and the volume of awareness on our side, which we clearly win. The second thing I'd like to note is that proposition cannot win on the principle. And this is for two reasons. First, that nonprofit charities still have to pay their employees and divert money to a supply chain. So there's some amount of profit, uh, profiting going on on either side. But furthermore, they never responded to our third argument, which is about why corporations will exploit people more without the profit opportunity that you get from backing social issues. So at best, we win this clash, but at worst, this principle is a wash. Okay, two themes that I'd like to explore in this reply. 
First on money, secondly on awareness. On money, this is an incredibly important theme because propositions model has no mechanism for people to get nuanced understanding of issues. The only exclusive harm they give is that all money goes to the social movement on their side while only some goes to it on our side. But this was a false dichotomy because if social movements can create clothes, they can do that too on our side. This is for people that are politically engaged enough to want 100% of their money to go to a social issue. So they, those people will buy that merchandise either way. But the exclusive benefit that you got on our side is that you add money to those social causes. So people who are not previously passionate about social issues will buy a Nike jacket, but they won't necessarily buy a scarf from the feminist movement. Even if only 20% of Nike proceeds go to that social issue, that is still 20% of money that would not have otherwise gone towards a social issue. So on that, we still add more money. And given this 20% is split between many, many people, that gives you money in the terms of billions of dollars. But this money uh, point is actually dis the deciding factor of this debate, because it allows us to co-opt all of Proposition's benefits. If Proposition cares about nuanced depiction of issues, we give them the money that they need to hire minority speakers and to run awareness campaigns. If Proposition cared about legislative change, we give them the money to pay for lobbying and political protests to get that legislative change. If Proposition cared about continued understanding of issues, that can't happen if the bank accounts of your social movements run dry and there are no more rallies for people to go to in the long term. So we end up co-opting all of the proposition claims about long-term understanding when you have more cash. Second theme then on awareness. Proposition says here that messaging is shallow, but we've said up and down the bench why this is symmetric. It's the same thing with the feminist scarf on propositions. They shoot themselves in the foot here. Given that there's a basic level of awareness and understanding on, our, uh, on either side, the difference is that people are more likely to buy Nike branded things because it's a trusted brand as opposed to some like random brand that's giving you scarves. So this is where our benefit about awareness comes comes in. They respond to this by the wishy-washy claim that social movements are already popular, but then they simultaneously say that social movements still have a long way to go and things like complacency are bad. This means that obviously there is somewhere to go in the form of awareness. We want things to become so trendy that they can never disappear from public discourse, where people can never stand against these issues uh, again. So we get more awareness, and that's probably a good thing. Because the impacts of this more awareness, as opposed to something like deep understanding, is that people become more accepting of people on our side of the house. More people feel comfortable coming out of the closet or reporting workplace harassment. And since social justice is about protecting marginalized groups, you can't get any sort of those benefits with a niche group of people because people feel like there won't be anybody to back them if they come out and report things. But furthermore, we give a critical mass of people who come out and vote. So on proposition, if 10% of people care about an issue deeply, they're never going to reform the legislative system that backs these issues. But when 60% of people support BLM because they buy a Nike sweater, then we get the concrete legislative change through voter blocks that's exclusive to our side of the house. So at the end of the day, any points about dilution and long-term engagement are awash, but we get more social and political capital to build long-term engagement and uh, change. Very proud to oppose. Thank you very much. Now I invite the speaker of the proposition for their reply speech. Here, here. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay, I think my Wi-Fi is recovered, so we can proceed. Okay. Let me make something very clear at the top of our speech. Don't let site opposition get away with co-opting all of our benefits suddenly in the op block. Why can they not do this for two reasons? Firstly, note that our stance has been clear from the beginning of the round that we support commercialization specifically for social movements as a means of raising money and getting funding. The difference is that on our house, only people who are passionate will likely buy from these movements in the very first place on prof world. In our world, we have two benefits. Firstly, that the market's far less saturated, so you don't get the perceptual acceptance of these types of individuals and people. But secondly, note that on our side, 100% of the proceeds inevitably go to these social movements as well as these social organizations. So that is the crucial difference that they never engage with. They can't just say that they co-opt all of our benefits just because we're selling feminist scarves. Note this argument about perception that is very important on our side, insofar as only feminists are buying feminist scarves and not random people who feel like they're buying in, buying it from Forever 20. 
2021. But secondly, know that they're trying to bank and win this debate on this money argument. Two reasons why they lose on this. Firstly, note that the only example we quote unquote didn't engage with was Nike, right? Who gave 20% of their proceeds to BLM. And we think this is a minority of instances where this happens in the first place. We told them to engage with examples like Forever 21 or Walmart, where they sell these things that capitalize on feminist and gay movements without actually giving them the, any of the money back. So they couldn't have relied their entire case on donations as well as giving returns back to the movement insofar as the motion does not specify that. And they had to defend companies who just didn't give the money back as well. Note that we agree money matters on our side of the house, but we think that matters far less than true legislative change that requires critical mass of buy-in of individuals who don't just change their opinion from buying a Nike sweater, but rather go out and vote and genuinely like care about the issues. This debate is about who swings the average individual. And that's reason why they lose because they never explain why their mechanism of buying a Nike sweater leads to the understanding of these issues or like going out to the polls and voting and protesting because I bought this sweater. More likely what's going to happen is that they feel as though their duty is fulfilled and they just don't touch the issue anymore. Quickly on the third sub, their, th their entire underlying assumption for our case is that companies care about PR, right? So if they care about PR so much and they're lobbying against reforming their child workplace or reforming any workplace conditions. We argue that there's probably not in the interest for them to do that. If people also care about PR, that's probably really bad PR. Nobody's going to buy their stuff anymore if they do that. And we also just think this is largely not comparative to the biggest clash in this debate about getting buy-in. So let's talk about buy-in and social media. Firstly, I would just like to point out how ridiculous their advocacy is coming out of their side. Look at their examples. It's about buying a Nike sweater and suddenly now you're going to do legislative change, show up to protest and to do all of these great things and be deeply invested. We don't think that's true. On ours of house, we forwarded two unique arguments that got little engagement. Firstly, on complacency. Why does this exist even if social movements on our side actually, why does this exist exclusively on their of house? This is because when social movements are the only people commercializing an arse of house, that means far less saturation in the market, which means it doesn't seem like all of these big brands like Walmart are actually in support of these movements, which show these movements as something still a little more fringe and needs work. On their side of the house, individuals think that just giving $10 via inadvertently donating through a sweater is enough and that these issues are already solved because there's already representation, but that's simply not true. But secondly, note that people's financial capabilities and attention spans are limited and finite. On our side of the house, we'd much rather them spend it on our counterfactual of social media and reading these things rather than copping out of it by saying, I bought a Nike sweater. I donated $10. We'd much rather them donate directly to this type of social organization, Arts of the House. We still get money because if each individual is able to buy in and care more, 100% of the proceeds go to them. That's more money on Arts of the House. We ultimately are more likely to change the average person insofar as they can't find excuses for themselves that, oh, I've already donated. For those reasons, we're proud to stand on side proposition and note that opposition really has no solvency other than to say, I don't need a sweater. So now we have legislative change. Comparatively, we win vote side proposition. Thank you very much for your speech. And I would like to thank both teams for this very nice debate. I invite you to virtually cross the floor and shake hands. Um, and now uh, to my panel, I invite you to close your cameras, um, close your microphones, and uh, please do take your time to uh, make a decision because we have a lot of content, content to go through. Um, and then come find me on Discord. Yes. Thank you to Team Canada for a great debate. Thank you, y'all. Great, babe.